Does your garden offer an appropriate and reliable source of food? Is it a safe and secure living environment? Is it a good place to hang out with others of your kind? The well-known nature photographer Denzi Klein was one of the most committed nature garden people I ever met. She lives on a normal suburban block in Sydney with a wild tangle of shrubbery that would make a traditional gardener itch for a brush cutter. Humankind seems to have a tidy up drive, a need to manicure and make things neat. It is not a drive that is wildlife friendly. Denzi has written whole books on spiders and insects which she finds in her garden. And of course, in such places, birds and frogs and lizards also thrive. There is a middle road, of course. You don't want a garden which you need a compass to navigate through. But the more you can resist the tidy up bug, the more wildlife friendly your garden will be. The first major consideration is plant species. Plant too many non-Australian plants and you will get non-Australian birds like Indian miners and starlings and sparrows. A few non-Australian plants is okay though because Australian wildlife can utilise some of them. The bulk of your plantings should be compact natives and native cultivars like banksias and grevilleas. Bear in mind though, many native plants like some grevilleas and banksias have about a 15 year life expectancy. They usually respond fairly well to heavy pruning, so long as about 30% of the growing heads are retained each year. I have a couple of Robin Gordon cultivars that are now about 20 years old and are still quite vigorous. I do not fertilise them. Some bird species, like the little wattle bird, seen here, are terrible bullies and will attempt to drive out all other birds, including small finches and tidy insect eaters like thornbills, silver eyes and wrens, which is why thick undergrowth shrubs are so important as they provide an effective line of retreat. Large flower clusters that occur on banksias and large grevilleas are favoured by large honey eaters. Small honey eaters do like small grevilleas like red, grey and pink spider flowers when they are unseasoned, but also much better able to utilise many other tiny flowers like the tubular eupacris, which are not suitable for the bigger honey eaters. These honey eaters include the scarlet, the spinebill, the fuscus and New Holland honey eaters, as well as part-time honey eaters like silver eyes. Some honey eaters, like the lewin, are also fond of soft fruit and berries, which they can handle in small mouthfuls by pecking at the whole fruit which is held on the branch. Figs are a wonderful source of food in season and much favoured by many birds like bowerbirds but of course the introduced bulbul and fruit bats also like them. Unfortunately the domestic fig seen here is also a target for fruit fly. Another major drawback with figs is their extensive damaging root system. I have to keep this one very heavily pruned to stop it getting too big. I had a beautiful native fig tree which I'd kept in a tub for many years. When I decided to plant it out it just took off and was much frequented by bowerbirds and cowells when it was fruity. It was well away from my house foundations and well away from those of the neighbours. Then one neighbour put in a below ground swimming pool not 25 feet away. 
So to avoid the inevitable, I decided to remove it. The neighbour wasn't worried about it until I suggested an indemnity for me and he quickly changed his mind. So the word is, don't plant trees with troublesome root systems like large eucalypts, figs, lily pilly, pin oak, liquid amber, anything that grows three metres or more high. Small scrambling plants and ground litter are very important to the small insectivores like wrens and larger ones like whipbirds and grey thrush. Bowerbirds too spend a lot of time on the ground. Resist the temptation to clean up seeding grasses which may result in your partner threatening to bring in a gardener. Just use the excuse I use. I'm leaving those plants for the wildlife. I do of course remove problem weeds like biddens or blackberry or many of the others that become quite a problem. Both bowerbirds and grey thrush are surprisingly Catholic in their diet. I thought the grey thrush was essentially insectivorous but they'll take cheese and even, at times, bird seed. Bowerbirds love fresh bean leaves, guava flowers and buds, the hanging basket plant chain of hearts, nodding violets, lawn grass, even the leaves of rhubarb, which I would have thought was poisonous. If you bring in commercially acquired tree lopping mulch, only do small sections of the garden at a time. Give time for it to break down a bit or mix it well with rotted compost. Only the English blackbird will thank you for a deep layer of tree lopping mulch. Talk about strange tastes though. Recently, rainbow lorikeets have been found eating mince meat that was put out for other birds, but not by me. It was about 15 years before the red-browed finches discovered that they could get some extra food at my place. The coolie hat is not to keep the rain off as the feeder is under a roof anyway. It is to stop mice climbing down the 8 gauge wire that suspends the feeder. Finches are wasteful, messy feeders so I am constantly cleaning up after them. I am not a big fan of food handouts. The birds are wild and must not become dependents. The feeder gives them a little help when they have three or four young fledglings to support. They are nomads anyway and can disappear for six months during winter. Before I put the cage around the bowl, crimson rosellas came to gorge and I was discouraging them and sending them away. That was a couple of years ago and they have never forgotten. Now, as soon as the back door opens, they fly off. They can stick their heads through the mesh and get a little snack, but they have to work for it. The bowl was too deep for the redheads to keep a wary eye out for wattle birds, so I put a cement floor in it. The plastic bottle hopper is suspended about two millimetres from the floor so only a little seed can flow into the bowl at a time. Another rewarding improvement was the frog pond. About three metres in diameter, 60 millimetres deep in the middle, with a stone island supported on a plastic box. Fish can swim through the box and hide under the island. The fish are a very small green freshwater fish about 25 millimetres long so they are no threat to tadpoles or frog spawn but they do keep mosquito larvae in check. They are not the notorious Gambusium mosquito fish though. 
I have three ponds in all. The others are much smaller cast fiberglass. We have a constant chorus of frog calls at night, which some people might find disturbing, including my wife. But the ponds are nowhere near neighbours' houses, so fortunately I've had no complaints. My wife was happy to see this water skink eating frog spawn in the little pond near our back door. The water skinks are very used to us and take no notice when we walk past quite close. They even try to get into the house at times. Marsh frogs and tree frogs are doing very well apart from the occasional large tadpole caught and eaten by water skinks. The tree frogs sometimes take up residence in flower pots. More food for birds. There is always something interesting going on in a wild and diverse garden. The wilder the garden, the more there is to see and enjoy.